Welcome to What's Next with Eric Wood, where we will prepare you to make your what's next in life your best yet. Our next guest is Golden Tate. Golden is a former NFL receiver playing 12 years in the league for the Seahawks, Lions, and Giants. He was a second-round draft pick, pro bowler, and Super Bowl champion. Golden is an all-around great dude, and we're going to have some fun chatting about what allowed him to be so great in athletics and also now thriving off the field as well. If you haven't already, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you tune in weekly. And also, if you haven't already, go to Amazon, order my book, Tackle What's Next, and the link to that is in the show notes. Thanks and enjoy. Golden, welcome to the podcast, brother. What up, what up? How we doing, man? Appreciate you having me. Yeah, and uh, it's it's been a while since we caught up in person. The next time we see each other, hopefully, is either on a golf course or pickleball court. You just finished your first singles tournament last weekend. We will get to that in a little bit, though, because I want to start in a different area. And, and one thing I'm fascinated, I'm raising two kids of my own. You have three kids now. But you grew up in a family where all four of your siblings and yourself go on to play college sports. What's the secret sauce in a household like that? to honestly we just it was our escape um mm. and we were blessed with the the ability of course and we just kind of worked at it we just continued to work at work at it and i know for speaking for myself like whenever i was on the baseball field the football field um, the basketball court nothing else mattered to me um, it didn't matter what was happening in my neighborhood at school um, at home and so that was just my that was my getaway and so I just, and it made me feel worthy. Um, but I, and I actually learned that later in life, like as I look back and try to understand myself and the psychology of all this stuff in the world and in life, I, I, that's what I realized. And so there was no better place to be than on some type of field doing some type of athletic. And I would play for days and nights. I mean, I, I remember summer nights just or summer days, waking up as soon as I could see the sun, asking to go outside and play my play with my friends in, in the middle of 95 degree humidity. Um, and we would play every single sport that we could possibly make up. Um, it's some with our imagination, some with actual balls. And, and, and we would just do it all day until the streetlights came on. We'd go home, go to sleep and do it all over again. And so I just always loved it. Always loved sports. Yeah, I, I'm not quite the athlete you are or were. I wasn't drafted in two different sports. Gold was also drafted in baseball as well, but I was the exact same way. It's funny, I've done a lot of introspective work as well, understanding that sports and the affirmations that I got from playing sports is something that I craved, which pushed me to to push my body to the limits to be able to constantly then get that affirmation to prove myself uh, worthy, as you said. And so uh, it's, it's interesting how you said that and how that hit immediately with me when you think about, because it, it, times have changed where kids aren't necessarily w going out the door in the morning. Cause I was the exact same way. Kids aren't running out the door in the morning to go play. They are so much more distracted than them. How are you going to use kind of those lessons, your childhood as an example to, to raise your kids as well? You know, I think it's all about the foundation that we build with our children um, and, and being intentional. Um, and that's one thing I'm working on because by default, we're always going to go back to how we grew up. And that's, you know, some parents are able to adjust, some parents are not, you know, like, yeah, I want to sit here and say, yeah, my kids aren't getting a cell phone until they're 15. But realistically, it's probably, you know, I don't want my kids to be like complete, feel like they're losers and, and not fit in. So I'm going to have to get it earlier. So you're going to make, have to make it, make some adjustments, but just kind of being intentional. Um, like I, like I kind of said earlier, just for me, there was no alternative. There wasn't, you know, yeah, I had maybe a PlayStation, but I didn't have that many games. There wasn't the social media and all the phone games. Like there was either go play outside or figure it out. Um, and so just it, with new times, I'm going to let them kind of develop. I'm, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to like what I think they're good at and what they enjoy um and i'm always going to have that available for them um to go do um I'm, I'm gonna try my best not to push you know golf and pickleball and and track on them but hopefully um they want to do it and if they want to do it i'm going i'm going to coach them as hard as i possibly can and let them develop to be hopefully um incredible athletes but even better humans 
I like how you said that. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to push it on them, but oftentimes what you model and what you enjoy and what your kids see you get enjoyment from, they want to do as well. And so it's been funny to see, like my kids will both tell you their favorite food is sushi, but that's what daddy loves. You know what I mean? Cause I put it on a pedestal. So then they say, Oh, that must be, you know, the best. I don't say necessarily pizza or something else. And now they love that. And they're getting into golf and pickleball and tennis and all that now. And some of it's their environment, what they're exposed to and whatnot. But what you make a big deal out of, they will as well. Mm-hmm. And so I'm pretty confident that you'll you'll have those uh, those kiddos out in the links, out on the court as well. Let's yeah. shift. Uh, but, but, one, but one other thing, one other thing. And so and I've also been th- I've thought about this, like there's nothing there's not too many greater feelings when your kids when someone asks your kids like who do you look up to and they say dad you know that to me that's like one day i hope my kids like i hope that that's what they say um and because that means that i am a good father that means they they trust me that means they love me that means obviously they look up to me um and that they that they feel like i'm doing something right in life which is you know parenting is very very important and so to me that that's an honor and that's what i hope for uh, one of these days and you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what see what happens. Yeah, I'm confident that you'll make that happen. And part of it is what you said, being intentional. You know, as dads, we're not going to be perfect, just like we weren't perfect as football players. But we were intentional about our careers, which allows you to play a long time and, and be successful. And if you take that same intentionality as a dad, there's there's a 100% chance that they'll grow up looking up to their dad. So um, I got full confidence in that. But let's Thank switch you. gears just a little bit. I grew up on the west side of Cincinnati, Catholic side of town. And it was it was a goal for all of us to go play at Notre Dame. Kyle Rudolph, same neighborhood. He actually did get to go to Notre Dame. I didn't. I didn't get offered by the Golden Domers. But when you're coming out of Tennessee, what drew you to want to go to Notre Dame? So it was kind of – it's kind of random actually um i get to my junior or my senior year and i've been recruited by just about everyone um still was i was a little bit slow taking my acts and stuff but um as i started getting these letters i was at pope john paul the second high high school which is a Catholic high school and they said dude you gotta go if you get recruited by notre dame you gotta go check them out you gotta go and i'm like and my mom I'm like man their uniforms are so boring and it's going to be cold out there. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not really feeling it. But people kept being on my ear, and then Notre Dame starts recruiting me. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go check it out. So I take my official visit, like, in the middle of, I don't know, December, January. They're getting ready for a bowl game against LSU, I think, at that point. Um, probably about, about 10 to 12 inches to, of snow already on the ground. I mean, wow. like, blistering, bone-chilling cold. and I absolutely fell in love with it. I don't know how, and it was my first visit, my first visit, and it checked the box of what I wanted. First thing was, are they going to let me play baseball and football? Yes, check. Do I have a chance at going pro at one of these sports? Check. I mean, it's Notre Dame, and on top of that, you got Charlie Weiss, who's won Super Bowl rings with the Patriots. I mean, right. in fact, he, he visited my school and spoke to me like this the whole time, just showing off his rings. It's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I would love to have you come to Notre Dame. But, and then thirdly, if I graduated, I felt like I was going to have a chance to, you know, do something in life. Because, you know, with a degree from Notre Dame, you're, you have a leg up, I feel like. Um, so I checked those boxes and I just looked around and went, yeah, you know, it's cold and it's going to have, we're going to have some gnarly days, but I can see myself here for four years. And so I ended up committing like the Monday or Tuesday after my visit. And it was on my first, first visits. And I said, you know what, to simplify life, I don't want to go visit Florida. I don't want to go visit South Carolina. And, and I was a hometown kid. So Vanderbilt's right down the road, but I didn't want to visit Clemson or anything anywhere else because I didn't want to have these thoughts in my head. It's like, you know, comparing one way or another. So I said, you know what? Notre Dame, let's ride out. Um, and funny story, I don't know if you're going to keep this in or, or cut it out, but we, I went out that night on a Saturday night during my recruiting trip and pretty much he said, hey, GT, what do you want to drink? And, you know, that's back during the Grey Goose era. I was like, never drink before, actually, never drink. I said, 
Grey Goose, because I hear about it in all the the songs that they were listening right. to. And so I have, you know, a few drinks, I'm drunk, and, and it got to the point where the Grey Goose was going down way too easy. We get back to my hotel room around 12 or 1, and they say, GT, you rolling with the Irish? I'm over the toilet. Go Irish. And wow. that was that was it. And so I, I ended up um, committing and never looked back. I've always been someone who, like, life is made of choices. Some are good, some are bad, but you they're, they're actions. You can't go backwards, but you can move forward. So I was never someone who would sit there like, man, what if I would have played baseball and foot, instead of football? Or what if I would have went to Vanderbilt instead of Notre Dame? I just keep it moving forward, focus on what's ahead, and make it all happen. And thankfully, it worked out. I had a plan, and it was executed perfectly almost. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It, it, I got a, I got a little overserved on my official visit to UVL as well. So uh, that, that's probably a common theme. You get these high schoolers in a in a college environment for the first time. I feel like that's probably pretty common. But um, yeah, that the the network that you get at Notre Dame as well. You're talking about having a degree from there, but then you get the network of Notre Dame grads when you're done. It's it's a powerful university. Uh, it's funny about Charlie Weiss. I've heard that from other guys before as well, where he shows off them Super Bowl rings, but when you earn it like he did, you get to show them off at that point and you get to use them as a recruiting tool. Um, so, so that's great. And so you enter the league, get drafted by the Seahawks, go out there, play with my boy Breno and a bunch of other guys that, that we have in common, uh, mutual friends. But in year four, you guys win a Super Bowl. And I love asking guys that won Super Bowls because I only won, I only played in one playoff game my entire career. So I, I obviously never even sniffed a Super Bowl. But that being said, what was different about that Super Bowl winning team compared to the so many others that you played on? You know, I did not appreci appreciate being on such a good team because I came into the league <clears throat> my first year as a rookie. We get Marshawn Lynch. We play. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> we yeah. sent him to you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We get Marshawn Lynch. We play the Saints, who are the defending champions in the first round of the playoffs. By the way, we got in the playoffs at at seven and nine that year. Wow. Let's see what happens. And we we beat them. I mean, that, I think that was Beast Quake. Yep. We beat the defending champions, and I'm thinking, oh, it's the NFL's not that hard. You know, we just beat the, the champions. All right, whatever. So we beat them. We lose the next round. Second second year, we don't go to playoffs. I'm like, okay, well, dang. I mean, but also we, we got San Francisco, um, who's, you know, really good. Third year, we make it to the playoffs. And we beat Washington first round. We go to Atlanta, get down like – we get down like 21-3, come all the way back. Um, and then we lost it at the end. They kicked the field goal. And in my fourth year, we we showed up in April and we just kind of we felt like we were going to win in the Super Bowl. It was like not even a doubt in our minds. And I don't know if it's ignorance or if it's just what it was, but we just looked around at like our personnel, our coaching staff, the depth we had, and we knew like, okay, if we stay healthy, we're gonna we're gonna go to the Super Bowl. We're gonna win the Super Bowl. And we we just it was almost a you watch the way we play, we play with a certain confidence borderline arrogance and you could see that and we just we we knew that we we're going to win at home in front of 12th man we weren't going to get beat at home period and we knew if we stole you know half of our away games we'd be good as well um and we got we had such a fantastic year and like the this the, the core of our you know we had a defense that was just lethal like they were dangerous we had legion of boom and then our our front seven was was nasty. Um, offensively, we could control games because we could run the ball on whoever, and that was just hard nosed football. We had a good defense, and you can run the ball. We might the other team might get six or seven. They might get the ball six or seven times, and that's that. That was the recipe back then of winning. Like good defense, run the ball, and so we just felt we felt really good. Um, and we just we treated everything like a championship moment, but. The one thing I look back and say I noticed with all the teams that I played on is that, you know, if we had the scouting department and the head coaching up here and then we had, you know, the, the players and, and even down to the, the cooks and the janitors, when they pulled, it was like we were always in sync. 
there was no no one was ever going down and someone's going up we were always right. connected and everyone was on the same page in the entire organization even the, even with the city and that's something that i noticed in detroit got better once i got there uh because of being more connected connected and being on the same page and same with same with philly and the giants um and so that was kind of the biggest thing that i thought is that everyone was on the same page no matter if it was players scouts janitors cooks the guys mowing preparing the field we were just all there and we just kind of we knew little did i know after being in seattle that going to the playoffs was going to be very very tough after that i went to detroit and we got in our first year and i felt like we you know should have won but i got to detroit we went to the playoffs a couple times but didn't win any games in the playoffs i got traded to philly and got a taste of winning in the playoffs and then obviously uh the giants we didn't even sniff it um when i was there but i was spoiled my first four years i've been i you know i played and I don't know, probably like almost eight or nine playoff games in my first four years with with Seattle. And then after that, I might have played in f four for the rest of the eight years that I played. Um, I always felt bad for people like you and Takeo Spikes. I mean, some of the guys are the best at what they do and sacrifice so much, man. Think about it. You show up in April, not because you just feel like beating up your body. Right. You feel like waking up at 6 a.m. to work out and to do it four or five times. A week. Um, the, the whole point of it is to be playing in in January and February, right? And to like, I always feel bad, man, because you guys put so much on the line. I know I lost a little bit of my love for the game when I was going into the seasons, knowing like we're, we 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 kind of stink. Like we're not, <laughs> you know, player wise. I think we could go to the playoffs, but just how disconnected we are around here and not in sync. Man, it, this is gonna be a rough year, and it's. I always felt it's always so bad. See, you got to see it early in your career, so you knew what that was going to look like. To me, we call it blind optimism, but every year heading into camp, I'm like, well, we have a lot of talent, and, and then it just never would work out. And then finally, my last year in the league, which ends up being the last my last year, I signed a contract extension before the season, but then I had the career-ending neck injury. That ends up being the team that everyone thought was tanking, and we're the team that breaks it. So it, it's funny, but I, I always would have optimism, but I never got to see what a Super Bowl uh, champion team looked like up close to be able to contrast it either. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, I would have some optimism, but yeah, it's, it stinks packing up your locker the day after the last regular season game every year when they're passing out uh, Super Bowl ticket order forms and you're eliminated in week 16 because and you're ordering your Super Bowl tickets to go to the game, knowing you have no shot at playing that, that, that definitely is not fun, but, yeah. but you talked about losing like that can, 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 can strip you of that passion, that love for the game. when did you know it was time to hang up the cleats? I, I still, <laughs> I, I didn't know, man. Um, and I believed that right now that I can play and I could be on anyone's team and be a, a number three at worst and work my way up because of them. I'm a slot guy. I don't need to have, I don't need to run a four, three. I don't need to, I just need to understand defenses and know how to get open, which I I knew and I know how to do that. Um, but you know, after I got to the, after the, the giants cut me and two years after my four year deal there and I'm, I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. Um, you know, I'll miss the guys, but I'll bounce back and I'll be able to go somewhere and, you know, I'm not going to, sign a four-year, $36 million contract, of course. But, you know, at this point, I'm not playing for the money. I'm set up for life, hopefully. Um, I just want to go somewhere and win and contribute and, and be a part of it. So I get cut, and I don't get a call. Mm. Like I'm, I'm waiting. I mean, I'm calling my agent. Like, I'm excited because, like, this is free agency again, but now I don't have expectations to, like, sign a three-, four-, five-year deal. Like, this is awesome. Sign a one-year deal to someone really, really good, go try to win a Super Bowl, and we're all good. And just didn't get many calls. And I was so confused, so confused. And and I just could, I couldn't get over, like, I wasn't going to go work out and be on the field four times a week on, like, hoping that someone calls. And and then the, the you know, but I did do it. And then the, the Titans call um, and give me an opportunity late in the season. A.J. Brown was hurt. Julio Jones was hurt. I'm from Tennessee. I'm like, thank you, Lord. This is, like, the ideal situation. I cannot wait. I'm going to put my best foot forward. 
I fly to Tennessee. I'm showing up to the, I'm showing up to work at six, six thirty. Like that's a full two hours before everyone has to be in there trying to learn a playbook as fast as I can. Cause I see nothing but opportunity. I love to, you know, do my thing here get extended. And I am grinding it out every single day. I'm in their office every single day. Like, Hey, teach me. But they didn't have any plans of using, utilizing me when I was in Tennessee. In fact, they, um, had preferred to play all the rookies that, you know, which is fine instead of a veteran guy who'd done this and won Super Bowls and, and knew how to win. And I was like, I was so confused. And so after a lot of praying, I was just like, Lord, just please show me yourself and show me like, what is my purpose for being here? Like, you know, obviously it's completely opposite of what I thought it was and what I wanted to be, but just show me what I'm supposed to do. Like, who am I supposed to um, bring towards you, uh, whatever it is. And, actually just i just kind of figured this out like a few weeks ago like looking back like maybe that was god just giving me my closure like mm. it's it's the end of the road for you and it wasn't it had nothing to do because i couldn't play because if you watched me the year before in new york jason garrett just didn't give me many opportunities but if you look at when i was on the field and when they did throw me the ball i came down with the ball like i i am i would consider myself one of the best con contested catch it, catching guys in the league um, I was able to climb the ladder at five, ten, one fourth, and 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 make plays. So I couldn't understand it. But going back to Tennessee, but I was like, okay, well, it, it, you know, if this is it, then I guess I got to accept it. Although I realized a year later, but ultimately, man, it, having three kids, I wasn't also I wasn't down with being a journeyman where I'm going to go to Indy for three, four weeks and be on practice squad and get cut there and then go to Jacksonville for six games I, you know i, I wasn't gonna do that to my family and i love my family so thankfully god had you know blessed us uh, financially to be okay and so i just kind of made the decision like look you know i'm okay with being done with it i feel like i have other opportunities such as being a pickleball pro which i gotta get my wife on board but um and so i'm, I'm kind of content um but there's something that i know that you're probably dealing with as well like i will like the sundays will never get old. Like I, I will, I, I'm going to try to hold on to those as much as I can in my memory and the camaraderie and, and the brotherhood of a locker room. There's nothing like it in my experience and in my belief of what that's like. I mean, just, and I, I'm going to miss that probably the most. And I do miss that the most. And I noticed that now I am searching for, and I'm thriving for like that brotherhood, um, and that community, um, and to top it off, like my last year of playing like real football was Kobe year. So I was like, right. Showtime Tate was like playing on an empty stadium, making first downs and able to hear the ball, like hit the ground or something. Like, I mean, it was kind of annoying, but that was kind of, that's kind of how it all went. Yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. You'll never miss, you'll never get over missing the guys. You're never going to get over. And I'm I'm just a couple of years ahead of you on this journey, so we're figuring it out together. But uh, but I've talked to so many people, and it's like uh, even even uh, musical artists, you you know, you chase that high of running out of the tunnel. They chase that high of getting up on stage, and so it's filling your life with things that you're passionate about, that you're fulfilled by. But then understanding as well, like it's okay that that was a really exciting, fun chapter of life. You have tons of great memories, and that's okay as well. It's okay to say I miss that. It, it, and it's truly all right. If you try and say, you know, oh, I'm definitely going to 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 outperform that that chapter of life, whatever it may be, you're competing against something arbitrary. It's it's very similar. People all the time ask me how much I miss playing football on Sundays. And I do miss playing football on Sundays. But you often look at it like a round of golf and you remember those two really good shots and you forget all the other crap that came along with it. You talk about being a journeyman, moving your family around. Thank God I never had to do that. I played my whole career in Buffalo, but so many guys are getting shuffled around. If I had played long enough, I probably would have done that as well. I, you know, you, you quickly forget about the season ending and five of those off seasons I had surgery and that wasn't even on our you know then you get surgery now you got two months of rehab when you're supposed to be chilling out having fun enjoying the fruits of your labor instead now you have surgery so you you remember the highs you know you remember mm -hmm. all those highs and then it's 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 just great and that's one good thing about having these conversations weekly it's it's to put it in perspective like 
and, and look, we're, we're both incredibly blessed with beautiful families and a lot going on in our lives. We can stay active. We can stay competing because we're not broken from the game. So it, it's great to have these conversations. But it, as you were talking, I, I, a lot of that resonates still with me today. Yeah. And it's, it's hard, man. It's, I'm not going to lie. Like there's days where I'm like watching games. And I'm like, dude, I was just burning this dude. Like I should be out there playing with him. There's also days I'm like, okay, well, the process and the journey of being ready for a game and like not even knowing if you're going to be called up or, or get to like utilize your talents. It's like, okay, well that's, you know, not worth the moving and all that stuff. So it's like, you know, but it's all perspective because like we have, you know, like these chemicals in our mind of dopamine being released every time we step out into the, uh, onto the field of having everyone cheer for us in the interviews after a good game. And, you know, all that comes with it. Um, you know, we're chasing that dopamine release constantly. And I think it's, you know, we got to get, we got to get control of that because it's going to be hard to get that specific release, but there's other things in life. And like, it's one thing that I'm really been praying for lately is like, like finding my new purpose. Like I grew up thinking like football was my purpose. I am on this earth to play football, score touchdowns and do it. And and yes, that was my purpose for, it felt, feels like a majority of my life, but like now I'm 34 years old and I can't, I can't be silly to think like, yeah, my purpose is over. No, right. I need to find something else to do. And not so much for the financial part of it, but for the passion part of it. And also again, being intentional for my kids. Like I don't want my kids just to see like dad's always around not really doing anything, he golf and playing pickleball and occasionally doing his honey to-do list. Like there needs to be more. And and that's for, for them, like to see, like, I want you guys to find something that you're passionate about and go get it. So that's kind of where I am in, in life. And for, I say the same exact thing. People all the time will say, well, well why do you work? Why, why do you push yourself? Why do you do this? I'm like, so my kids see that a man is a provider and mm -hmm. a man is a worker. We are built to work. I've made us to work. Now we have a certain amount of freedom where we don't need to work our lives away. We need, we have the ability to be intentional with them, but I don't want my kids. Cause my daughter was two when my career ended. My son was born the day I found out I got the news that my career was over. And so wow. my kids don't appreciate the work that was put in by me, the sacrifices their mom made as well to support that career. They don't appreciate that. They just see that we got really nice things. We could take nice trips and, you know, they can go to nice schools. And so I want them, even in this next chapter of life, uh, to understand that dad works and he'll work his tail off. I got to tell you the story real quick. So my daughter was, um, at the, in the, like the interview process to go to this private school in, in Louisville. And one of the questions, and we didn't prep her on this and I was excited to hear what she said, um, one of the questions was, what do your parents do for a living? What are their jobs? And she said, my mommy's a mommy. And I was like, well, and at this time I was calling games for the bills on the radio and calling games for ESPN. So I'm on TV, you know, twice a weekend that they can see me. And, in, and instead of saying like my dad's in sports broadcasting, she said, my dad has a podcast. And I'm like, that's fine. It's just way better than her saying like, he's a, he's an aspiring golfer. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> that being said, it's it's it is all about finding something that that you can that you can pour some energy into, and and one of the things I realize I miss the most, and we'll we'll transition to a little pickleball talk right now. Uh, the guests lately, so the guests we're at almost two hundred episodes, and wow. and all the listeners have had uh, the the beauty of seeing my passions change, and that gets worked into all the conversations. So we've had some pickleball conversations lately, but that being said. Pickleball has found, given me something that I can compete at. It's open early. So we played we played this morning at 6 a.m. I played with uh, uh, two former college tennis players that are women, both one's professional, one's 5'0 plus, and a 5'0 dude. And, yeah, I got my tail kicked at times. But, like, to me, to get out there and compete, like, that's a great way to start my day. So that being said, you, you mentioned that maybe trying to make a, a journey to be a professional pickleball player, what's that journey going to look like? Well, that journey is not going to be started until um, Mrs. Tate it signs the paperwork and says, okay, I will support this because right now she just sees it as no more than a hobby. And she, you know, we have a five or four and a 10 month old. She's really not okay with me um, traveling on the weekends to go play in tournaments. Like I played one yesterday and she was, it was a local tournament and she was not that excited about it. But um, for me, just like, 
you know, God gave me all this athletic ability and I want to absolutely use it up. And I realize like, as I get older, the ability is not going to be there as much. So like, and I feel like I'm super like top percent as, as far as athleticism. And I feel like this is a sport that, um, you know, I could be a part of like something that's bigger than me. Um, and I think this could be something that I could help NFL players potentially transition into because as much as we love basketball and doing all this other stuff that requires you to run and jump, like we, we can't be playing, you know, I, I used to play basketball when I was a year six and seven. And I remember even back then it'd take me four days to get to, you know, for my legs to get back and the aches mm-hmm. to go away. So I feel like this is a unique sport that's active. Um, I think it's lower impact um, when you're playing doubles at least. And I just, I love seeing the sport grow um, and it's super addicting and you get the community part of it, the, you get the um, competitive part of it. And I think it's a, it's a sport that it doesn't matter if you never touched any type of paddle racket or if you are a tennis player, I think you can play. I think you can play and you can progress in it. So that's what I love about it. Um, as far as the journey, like um, I'm just trying to play um, every day. Um, or as much as I can, I put my golf clubs down. I know you're a heck of a golfer. I remember when I was golfing with you, you were incredible. But right now, I don't know if it's because of the weather or the season or what it is, but I've not had much interest in golf. I've been wanting to be on the pickleball court. Um, and I try to play with – I whenever I sign up to play, I try to tell the people I'm playing with, like, whenever you find the group, like, I want to be the worst one on the court. I want you guys to absolutely work me because I feel like that's how you get better. And I can take yep. it. I can take it. Like – like I know ability wise, I'm going to have the most athleticism on the court, which doesn't matter as much right now. But once you get the fundamentals and the techniques and the understanding the IQ, I feel like if I can put all that together. I could, you know, do something special in this sport. So um, I've been just really enjoying it. Um, and the tournament out. Uh, so <laughs> I had a tournament this weekend and um, I treated it like a football game, like and it was not even on purpose. It was like, okay, we got the tournament this week. So um, the night before I got an Epsom salt bath, I yep. was looking at the the roster of players and in, in our in our bracket, trying to like see like, you know, what they're doing. It was similar to like getting a scouting report. Um, there was a few um, people in the bracket that guys that I know had played. So I was like sending out texts like, hey, you know, I saw that you beat this guy in this tournament. Like, do you remember what you did? I was like full on like football mode. I got in the bed. I was like watching like the PPA tour, like looking at my boy Tyson and Connor Garnett um, and a few other people trying to figure it out. And I woke up that morning. I had a guy show up at my house at 6 a.m. Um, to stretch me. Um, I did my car, you know, I got my carbs in that morning and then I hit the road, listened to my worship music and, and got there and was like laser super focused all to go, um, one and two and be done. Uh, we, we ended up losing to, um, first off the, the team that won gold, which it was 4.5, 4.5, 19 plus bracket. Um, they won gold. And then our second game that we lost, which is, you know, you go one to 15, we lost to a 14 year old kid and a maybe 16 year old kid. Oh yeah. And it was like, and then afterwards the kids and the kids parents was like, Hey, we're big fans. Can we take a picture? I'm like, sure. Yeah. It was like, it was crushing me. It would crush me, but it was can be the most humbling game ever when, Guys that are guys and girls that aren't the same athlete, they are much older, much younger. It, it's a neutralizer, you know, their, their skill. And, and we don't have a ton of paddle sport experience. There's times where I do something with my paddle. I'm like, what was that? I was like, I don't know. I don't, I didn't grow up playing racket sports. So mm-hmm. I'm just kind of on the fly. Now I I've taken a couple of lessons. I'm starting to learn the techniques as well, but uh, yeah. I, so my first tournament, we ended up winning, but the competition wasn't great in this tournament, but, same way and yes like the result wasn't where you wanted it and and this is this is kind of a lesson no matter what you're into whether it's pickleball football a sales meeting that maybe didn't go your way like you got to enjoy the journey and, and some of the beauty of it is getting your mind right like putting yourself in that moment to compete again like yeah it didn't work out but you put yourself on the line if you never put yourself on the line then you don't like you don't feel anything in life anymore mm-hmm. and i don't want I, I don't want it to sound that that extreme but for the longest time, when my career was over, I was like, man, like when I got into broadcasting, everyone was like, man, it's great. You're around the game. And I was like, I know, but 
there's times after the game, like even on a loss, like I wish I was in that locker room right now. Like just so you feel it, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like I'm hitting the road, I'm flying out, I'm I'm gone. So uh, I'm glad you got the experience that I'm looking forward to to following that journey. We're gonna have to get out on the court uh, a little bit soon. I got I got two more quick ones for you. One, I know you're a man of faith. You recently got back from uh, PAO, which is a pro athlete outreach. It's a deal that they do for for current and former NFL players. Uh, just explain to me and the listeners what what role does your faith play in your life? Oh wow! Just I'm I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, so faith for me is 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 also a journey, um, and there's times where I feel like I am the perfect believer and follower, and there's times where I I'm here and I know that I need to get closer to God, read more, be better. I mean, I think that's a unique thing about um, being a person of faith. And we're always striving to be better. Um, and it's hard. I mean, the standard is set, set high. But I think understanding our maker and understanding who God is, is that, and there's people who are going through out there, going through things out there that I want you just to, to hear this, like, no matter where you are in your journey, um, what you did yesterday, what you're going to do, just know that you are covered and you are loved. Um, mm. and I think I noticed that I am at my best and I am the most confident person when I understand the love that Jesus has for me and the sacrifices that Jesus has made for me to live and to see and to be healthy. And, um, as I try to understand him more, it, it excites me more. Um, I feel that my joy level is very high when I start the day off in the word. And I feel like I am, I'm putting on this armor. Of, uh, that's going to help me get through the day because this world, if you, th- these materialistic in this world is not set up for really Christians. It's just, it's, it's not, there's sin everywhere you look um, on TV, on our radios, when we're driving in our minds. I mean, it's just everywhere, but because I've, I'm intentional with spending with time with God, I feel like I have a chance at beating these worldly um, things that are thrown my way. So and it hasn't always been that way. I've always known there was God and believed in God, but there was times where I just wasn't acting um, in a manner that he would want. And so now that, again, I have kids and I want them to see this example, I'm trying to be better. Um, and so I would just encourage like people out there. I know people out there are going through a super tough time right now. And I know there's people out there that feel like they're at the highs of highs. And I would just say, um, no matter if you're here or here, just make sure one thing you guys have in common is that you have um, God on your mind and that you're being intentional with spending time with him. Because if you look around and if you really think about it in perspective, I'm a huge perspective guy. Like like I could be in San Diego. I'm in San Diego, California right now. And if I really wanted to be, this could be the worst place in America. Or if I wanted to be the best place in America, I can do that because it's all perspective and how you look at things. But I would just say, um, like if you look around, like, God created all this for community and relationship. Um, and so me being intentional, I try to surround myself with other Christians. And I was ignorant enough to think like when I was younger that, man, you know, the perfect Christians out there just aren't cool. And that's not the case. Like one thing I've been praying for lately is like, hey, Lord, please place people in my life that love you as much as I love you, but also have some of the same interests that I have in womb. Like, yes, I've always known you, but I didn't know um, where you were in your faith. I didn't know. I knew you were a heck of a golfer, a heck of a, a player, but I didn't know that you um, played pickleball up until recently. And boom, look, I mean, that's a, pre- that's a, that's a prayer answer right there. Like you love golf, you mm-hmm. love Jesus, you love pickleball, you love family. Those are some of the things that are the highest on my, on my list right there. Those four things. And like, just like li- when you pray, just listen and, and people get caught up thinking they have to pray by only looking up, but you can pray and just look around. And if you look for God, you will find him wherever you are. And so I know I'm going on a lot right there, but just, I would encourage people like to just to keep fighting, just keep fighting mm-hmm. um, because the, en- the enemy is going to be relentless and loves to kill and destroy anything that, that we have good. Um, but if we understand who our, our maker is and how much God loves us, I think we know um, that he is faithful, he is just, um, and that even when we can't feel him or feel like we see him, he will find a way for us. Um, and he loves us that much. And so as I read the Bible and just understand like the miracles that he's, he's done um, in the Bible, and I hear about the miracles that he's done to people, you know, for people around me, like it, it excites me um, and it motivates me. 
and it makes it makes this world view that I have seem like it's this big and it really doesn't matter. Mm, man, that's that's well said. I, I appreciate you sharing those words. Uh, th- that was powerful. And, and there's there's more than one person out there that needed to hear them. So I appreciate you sharing that. Last one for me. This is what's next with Eric Wood. What's next for Golden Tate? What do you got coming down the line for you here coming up? Ooh. I'm going to, um, I know I want to be in broadcasting. Um, so I'm definitely, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm in the process of doing some training and trying to make sure I, I get polished up before I actually like dive into, you know, something big, because last thing you want to do is get on Fox and NFL network, yes, been and not be ready and make a complete fool of yourself on TV. So I'm trying to avoid that. So I'm trying to prepare, but all while just being a really good dad, um, but also feed my competitive need um, and, and pick a ball and, and golf. Um, and so I got a few, I got another tournament, a PPA tournament coming up next month. Um, I have a member guest golf tournament coming up next month. I'm going to have to start practicing for and all we're trying to prepare for, you know, broadcasting, but that's kind of what I got going on. We should team up and get in the tournament soon. Let's do it. I was just going to say that sounds like my next couple months as well. It's, it's golf tournaments. It's some pickleball mixed in trying to win at home first, impacting Grace, Leslie and Garrett first. And then, yes, it, it's funny. Like, I, I, I'm i glad you say, like, to fill my competitive need through pickleball and golf because that's what it is for me as well. It's almost like my fix that I need. And as long as I get that competitive fix, because I don't want to be competing at home. I don't want to be competing with my wife. You know, I don't need to be on edge around the house. I need to get that out in other outlets. So I appreciate the way you said that. That is exactly what I'm going through right now. It's this is how it is. So I'm a morning guy now. You know, get let me get all my stuff done that I need to do for myself, working out, pickleball, whatever it is. But I have noticed like on days where I don't like golf or play pickleball or do anything that's like competitive, like I'm just in a funk. It's like I'm just like I feel like, all right, I did my honey to do list, I played with the kids, I, you know, did a lot around the house, I made our house a better home but I didn't do anything competitive. And I just feel like, man, I didn't do much today. But then when I, the next day I do all those things I just mentioned, but I play pickleball or go practice golf or, you know, work out or whatever it is. And then I knock out all that stuff. I feel like I had the, the greatest day ever. Like, I mean, I did everything I need to do. Like I am complete. I am whole. I have my fix of what I need. I am ready to be a better dad, a better husband, um, a better ho- home improvement guy um, and, and all of it. And it's like, I need my fix. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Hey brother, I can't, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know how busy you are. Um, so thank you very much for making the time to impact me, impact the listeners. We are definitely teaming up, whether it's on, we need to team up on both the golf course and the pickleball, because even the way you said, I'm starting to prepare for a member guest, or I need to prepare for it. Like that's how I am as well. Like, like you show me a scoreboard, I'm coming after it. Like I'm not at that member guest to just, drink beer and have fun. Like I'm there to win and people always crack up. Like I won't give someone a short putt and they're like, you know, that was good. And I'm like, yeah, but in three holes from now, he's going to be a little bit more worried about blowing a putt past the hole. Cause he knows I'm not giving him anything. Mm-hmm. And so I love playing those games and compete like that. So, so we'll, uh, we'll team up here before too long. Oh yeah. All right, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate you doing this and this podcast. I'm definitely been a, always been a fan of you, your work ethic, what you've achieved in this league. Um, and, and how long you did it. So, so thank you for being you and, and the fact that you're able, that you are now sharing your wisdom um, with other people. Um, I can only imagine how many people you're affecting and how many people look forward to, to seeing you on this podcast and the guests you have. And I just thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, brother.